All right, so it's about 3.10. We can begin. Uh, today's seminar speaker is Dr. Mark Hickson. He's going to be talking about lionfish research, and he's a professor from the Department of Biology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and is the Sydney Erica Shao Endowed Chair in Marine Biology. And so his expertise is in the ecology of coral reefs, and his research emphasizes underwater experiments using scuba. And Mark also completed his degree work at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he studied the ecology of kelp forest fishes. Additionally, he was an NSF postdoc fellow at the University of Hawaii, where he began his studies of coral reefs in the late 1970s. Then from 1984 to 2012, Mark was a professor in marine ecology and conservation biology at Oregon State University. And really, his research really addresses the questions of what determines the number of fish in an area, and how, and how so many different species naturally coexist with each other, and how marine reserves and artificial reefs work. And currently, he studies the invasion of Atlantic coral reefs by Pacific lionfish, and uh, is starting new studies of Hawaiian coral, uh, coral reefs. And, and as an author of over 100 scientific publications, he was honored in 2004 by the Institute for Scientific Information Citation Index as the most cited author on coral reef ecology in America. And a Fulbright Senior Scholar and Aldo Leopold Fellow, Mark serves on the editorial boards of the scientific journals Coastal Management, Ecology, and Ecological Monographs, and as an ad hoc editor for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He is the past chair of both the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Ocean Sciences Advisory Committee for the NSF Foundation. And Mark has also won various awards for teaching and his public outreach includes many lectures, media interviews, and most recently, TED Talks on the web, web and appearances on the PBS TV show, Saving the Oceans. <laughs> now that I'm out of breath. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, Chris has been a wonderful host, and everyone's been very hospitable. It's been really a pleasure visiting. But I have to say, um, I underwent sort of a temperature shock coming here. <laughs> the difference between the high temperature in Hawaii right now and the low temperature here right now is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Went from 85 to minus 15, and um, I'm an example of uh, heat shock proteins in action at right this moment. <laughs> So, um, as Chris said, uh, my lab's been studying the invasion of Atlantic coral reefs by Pacific lionfish, and I'd like to share that work with you today. Um, I'm going to be highlighting the work of my graduate students, because at my age, they're doing most of the work. Um, so, um, let's get going. I'll be introducing each of these um, in the list there as we go along. So invasive species are not new anywhere. They're very common everywhere, even here in Iowa, as you all know. Um, the one difference between these invasive fish, which I got off the DNR webpage, and our species is that our species is a piscivore. It eats primarily other fishes, and it's a very voracious predator. So um, I've heard all the horror stories of what's going on here. We're dealing with at least as bad a horror story in the, in the Caribbean region. So the story began when um, a very popular aquarium fish, um, Taurus volatans, the red lionfish, which is a native of the western tropical Pacific, was first noted off uh, Miami region in the mid 80s. Uh, by the turn of the millennium, it had rocketed up the Gulf Stream, up the east coast, um, then jumped across to the Bahamas and rapidly spread throughout the greater Caribbean region. You can see the years ticking off there in the upper left. Exactly how far they will spread ultimately will probably be determined by prevailing water temperatures. So on the east coast, you don't see adults past Cape Hatteras where the Gulf Stream um, breaks off the, the east coast. Um, they have yet to breach the mouth of the Amazon, which provides sort of a, a natural barrier, but eventually it's predicted that the entire coast of Brazil will have this invader. So the Brazilians are, are just now starting to freak out at that, uh, the apprehension of that invasion. There's some rumors about right now that these things may have breached the Panama Canal. Um, if that takes place, this will be the first invasive species in history that invaded the eastern tropical Pacific from the western tropical Pacific via the Atlantic Ocean. 
which just shows you how much humans are reshuffling species over this planet. So there's two questions that my lab's been funded to answer. One, and both from a very practical standpoint. One is, is there any native biotic resistance in the system? Are any native species stepping up to slow down the invasion? If so, we'd want to foster those species somehow and have, make sure our management protects those species. And then secondly, what are the ecological effects of this invasion? So um, starting with uh, the idea of biotic resistance, if you think of all pairwise interactions between species, um, there could be competition, between native species and lionfish, potentially predation, where native predators may attack them, and another more obscure interaction called immensalism. This is a zero minus interaction. For example, if I walk down the street and step on ants accidentally, it's bad for the ants and it doesn't make any difference to me at all. That's immensalism. So we investigated all three of these potential interactions. And the short story is there's not much biotic resistance going on in this particular case. Incidentally, these fish were introduced via the aquarium trade. They're very popular, popular aquarium fish. Probably people were releasing them into waters off Florida before moving on. Um, a recent study showed that at any given time in waters off Florida, there's about two dozen Indo-Pacific reef fishes living, but it's typically one individual there, one individual here, um, and wouldn't you know it, probably the worst species is the one that took off. So starting with competition, or, or first actually went and did um, comparative studies between the native range and the invaded range. And what we found right off the bat was that lionfish are rare throughout their entire native range, except in a few localized locations. Um, their densities are very low, even though they have a broad geographic range, and much, much, much higher in the invaded range, which is indicative of low biotic resistance um, and um, some kind of ecological release taking place. Uh, we time budgeted them in both oceans. They feed at about the same rate, but they eat much larger prey in the Atlantic, uh, a much greater diversity of prey, and consequently have higher growth rates and reach a much larger maximum size. So right off the bat, we knew that things were not looking good with this particular invasion. But looking at these potential sources of biotic resistance, we first started with the potential for interference competition, that is competition via direct aggression. And in particular, we looked at a, a hypothesis that had been posed for native Pacific fish where territorial damselfish, which defend small patches on corals, um, small algal mats that they defend from other herbivores, can actually be a refuge for settlement size recruits of other species, like these small wrasses. And the idea is that these small new recruits are not a threat to the territorial damselfish, but the damselfish sort of keeps everybody else away, therefore potentially protecting these, these prey from, from predation. So my grad student, Ty Kindinger, um, did sort of a classic model bottle experiment with uh, these three spot damselfish in the Caribbean putting fish of different species in a clear plastic bottle and then moving that bottle different distances toward the damselfish territory until the damselfish attacked and if it did attack then counted the frequency of attacks, how many times it nipped at the bottle. So comparing lionfish to a variety of native species as well as to an empty bottle. So if the lionfish are important um, or if there's this sort of refuge effect, then we would expect lionfish to be chased quite a bit. And the answer is, they didn't chase the lionfish. So in the upper panel, we had the maximum distance of attack, that is how far from the edge of the territory the damselfish would go out and attack. Um, and the bottom is the number of attacks. And what you can see, comparing these last two columns, is they attack lionfish at the same rate they attack empty bottles, which is basically not much. Um, whereas they most frequently attacked, as you would expect, fellow herbivores that are the greatest threat to their food resource. So, no resistance there. Regarding exploitative competition, the question was, do lionfish 
compete or potentially do well even in the presence of native predators that are ecologically somewhat equivalent. Now there's nothing like lionfish in the Atlantic Ocean. Nobody's ever seen anything like it in evolutionary time even. But small grouper such as Coney and Graysby also eat fish. They're about the same size and they overlap quite a bit in diet. So my student Mark Albans, who's now doing a postdoc at Auburn University, set up an experiment on patch reefs in the Bahamas where he seeded um, lionfish alone or coney grouper alone or coney grouper with lionfish, keeping densities constant, and followed their um, survival and growth through time. These figures compare um, the um, growth rate in, um, whoops, growth rate in, in both length and mass of each of the four treatments. So you can see here's the species raised together, coney alone, lionfish with coney, and lionfish alone. And there's two things that came out of this. One is, and most importantly, the lionfish grew at a far greater rate than the native piscivore did, indicating that it was much more successful at capturing prey, but also that there was no interaction between these species. It wasn't as if either species decreased the, or affected the um, growth rate of the other species. And what appeared to be happening behaviorally here was that lionfish were just so effective at capturing the fish on the patch reefs that we typically see the groupers feeding away from the patch reef. But no overt aggression between these, just pure displacement. In any case, there was no indication that the native grouper was outcompeting the lionfish. So much for competition. What about pathogens? Um, we've seen no evidence of disease in these things, but my student Lillian Tuttle is examining the relative parasite loads of lionfish in both their native range in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And this just shows an example of a percent of individuals infected, just one one part of her data. So in, um, in the Marianas Islands, Guam, in the native range, you can see that lionfish and their congeners have quite high parasite loads compared to ecologically similar native species on the same reef, whereas in the invaded range, lionfish, both in the Bahamas and the Cayman Islands, have quite low parasite loads compared to ecologically equivalent species. So no evidence of high parasite loads in the invaded range. This whole talk's gonna be like this. It's like one depressing thing after another. <laughs> so what about predation? Um, we have found in studying a variety of native species that the predation gauntlet shortly after a fish settles onto the reef is the major population bottleneck for many reef fishes. So what about lionfish? Well, this is where the story gets incredibly frustrating for us. These things settle at about two centimeters in length. This is a brand new recruit um, with a um, centimeter scale next to it on, on a sponge <laughs> in the Bahamas. These things are incredibly difficult to find. As I'll show you, lionfish are very, very abundant. You see many individuals in the 10 centimeter or so range, but you never find babies. These things hide out somewhere. We've searched everywhere. We search in the roots of, of seagrass stalks, um, every conceivable habitat, mangroves, what have you. You just can't find the babies. So what this suggests to us is that this is the vulnerable stage. And they're so unique in their appearance. I mean, look at those pectoral fins with the eye spots all over them um, that native fish probably have no idea that they're prey, let alone fish. But I'll bet you that there's something in the Pacific that cues in on these guys and can find them. There's far more species of ray fish in the Pacific and our working hypothesis is that there, the control is probably some predator that seeks these out and gets them when they're young but they're so hard to find that's just gonna be sitting around in the air as a hypothesis till we can dig these out some way sometime in the future. But we do know that once they get a little larger that they're pretty much invulnerable to predation. And that's true of the Pacific as well. So there's a couple things going on. First, 
they have this weird behavior where if they're out and about during the day, like this individual, they sort of act like they're attached to the reef and they waft about. And does that look like anything to anybody who studies or has been on a coral reef to you? It looks to me like a feather duster star. Uh, not star, feather duster worm. I'll show you a photo of one in a minute. And they just kind of waft around like that. Nothing in the Atlantic looks like that except feather duster worms. Okay, so this is not published. This is just something we've seen and gone, wow, it looks like not only they're cryptic, but they may be even mimics. And the mimicry may go two ways as well. It could be that, um, that um, things that attack feather duster worms also attack lionfish now and then and get a mouthful of spines. So that's the second way they're protected. Um, they have long dorsal spines as well as venomous pelvic and anal spines that are pretty nasty. The venom is located in grooves along the length of the spine. So when the spine penetrates sufficiently deeply, you get the venom in you. And it's a nasty venom. It really hurts tremendously. Um, I've fortunately only been stung once and it was by a small individual. By the way, when they first settle, their spines are flexible and not much venom. Another reason they're probably vulnerable at that early stage. But um, these... Um, these spines are, are really nasty. So once they reach a size where the spines are well developed, there's not much interest in by native predators. Incidentally, you don't want to get poked by these things. So these are the hands, the right and left hand of the same individual, believe it or not, um, where you can see the arrow shows where he got poked in the finger by a spine and that swelling is extremely painful. If you ever do get poked by a lionfish or anything in the ocean. Um, just soak it in the hottest water you can stand, which tends to denature the, the um, venom. And then take the best pain meds you know of, because it really, really hurts. But we've been lucky. We've only had a couple stings in our lab studying these things for five years. So if you're reasonably careful, it's not like you're putting yourself at risk all the time. But anyway, you can imagine taking one of these things in your mouth, and it's probably not a very good thing. So this was a Nassau grouper that we found during one dive that sat perfectly still throughout the entire dive, just like this, with its lionfish. And it looked like both the fish were really miserable, as far as we can read the continents of fishes. But they just sat there like that. And clearly this grouper had gone off to the lionfish in the wrong direction and had spines throughout the roof of its mouth. and. I imagine if it either got this thing down, if it ever did, it probably ultimately spit it out, that it probably wouldn't go after a lionfish again. And there's some evidence of that, this throughout the Caribbean. Um, you can see this eel probably didn't have a good time either with two lionfish spines sticking through the side of its face. So we see predators occasionally go after them, but it seems to be a very rapid learning response. Maybe I'll try to eat this weird looking thing. Oh crap, it really hurts. I don't think I'll eat these things anymore to be anthropomorphic. So not much evidence of predation. So what that leads us with is um, the possibility of a mensalism. So this is an experiment by another ex-grad student, Tim Pusack, who's now postdocing at the University of South Florida where in a series of natural patch reefs and also these artificial reefs, he set up a gradient of densities of, of Nassau grouper, this, this largest, most common grouper in the Bahamas, and then um, seeded these reefs with small lionfish. And the idea was to look at, through time, um, patterns of recruitment of lionfish, um, growth, mortality, what have you, to see if there are any sort of grouper effects. And the results were not what we expected at all. First, there was no effect on lionfish survival. It didn't know, matter how many groupers were on a, on a reef. From zero to five um, percent survival was, was roughly the same among treatments. The growth rate of the lionfish was also unaffected. Same, same axis here except for growth on the y-axis. And nothing else we could see as far as the effect on the lionfish was concerned. But it got very interesting when we looked at patterns of recruitment of native species uh, in these different treatments. So what we see here is a time series 
from the start of the experiment to the end. So this experiment ran three months over the course of the summer recruitment season in the Bahamas. And the y-axis is net recruitment, sort of, you know, giving pluses and minuses of fish accumulated on reefs through time. Um, you know, what do you see? So without any predators on the reefs, you see this sort of baseline of accumulation of fish over the course of the summer. New baby fish of various species settling and growing on the reefs. If you look at the treatment with just lionfish, you can see that they basically cut off recruitment. They ate virtually all the recruits that came in um, by the end of the experiment. That, that was it. There were no recruits on those. So what about the lion, what about lionfish with NASA grouper. If there were just a few NASA grouper, one to three on the reefs, there was no difference at all. But once you got to higher densities of NASA grouper, suddenly you got no net effect on recruitment of fish. So what was going on here? Remember, survivorship and growth of the lionfish was no different between treatments. So you put out some GoPro cameras and watched for a while, and what we started to notice through a lot of observations was that it was truly immensalism. What happens is, I'll show you movies of this, but lionfish are stalking predators. They slowly move up on their prey and then swallow them at the last bit. What was happening is just big fish swarming around that reef would interfere with foraging by the lionfish. So before the lionfish had a chance to attack, a big fish would swim between them and break off the attack and inhibit the foraging ability of the lionfish on the reefs. Instead, the lionfish would start feeding off the reefs and eating fish that inhabited the seagrass beds. So that created a safe zone right around these reefs just because there are big fish swarming around inhibiting lionfish foraging. True immensalism, because the grouper really didn't care. No indication of behavioral interactions between the species. So it's sort of a little interaction diagram. You have the grouper inhibiting the foraging of the lionfish, which are eating the native species, therefore an indirect positive effect on the native species. So the groupers would be the savior, but here's the problem. These are the most overfished fish in the Caribbean region. And in many areas, groupers are essentially, essentially exterminated, ext extirpated. So through most of the Caribbean, the situation is this. Lionfish get to do anything they want, which is to rapidly convert native fish biomass into lionfish biomass. So the end story is, there's not much biotic resistance out there. So we're ending up with a voracious predator that eats a broad variety of native species. If you've studied piscivorous fish before, you usually get a lot of empty guts because they eat now and then, but they're not eating all the time. Lionfish eat all the time. Every time we cut them open, we get lots of little fish inside of them. So here's a thousand lionfish cut open, had about two prey each. 41 species have been found in their guts, ranging over 21 families of reef fish. Very, very broad diets. Um, they also are habitat generalists. They will occur from zero to a thousand feet at least, way deeper than divers go. And all they really want is some kind of shelter because they don't like currents. They're not particularly streamlined fish. So they like to hang out under structure when they're not feeding and they're sort of everywhere. And they have a unique predatory behavior unlike any other piscivorous fish in the world. Those large pectoral fins are actually used like little herders and they slowly herd small fish in the crevices and reefs typically, and then slurp them up. This is slowed down a little bit. So this is the fun part. You get to watch lionfish eating fish. This is super slow motion. Watch the fish go past the gills. Woo! <laughs> and one more. So very good at what they do. It's even more unique than that. Not only do they slowly herd their prey, but they do something really weird that's never been noted before in, in any predatory fish. 
that we start noticing in the field is, and I'm going this will become more and more obvious, but it looks like that lionfish is hyperventilating if you look closely. It's opercular or flaring out. It's actually blowing streams of water at its prey. As soon as it'll grab that prey. Oh. Do one more from the field, then we'll take it in the lab where it's more obvious. So flaring its opercula, actually blowing water at its prey. So what could be going on here? There's a variety of hypotheses. We don't think they're blowing any kind of anesthetic toward the fish. We think it's one of two things. Either it's just sort of distracting the prey. This is a small lionfish Oop. eating a goby, that's almost as big as it is. They typically eat prey up to about half their body length. Either that or what seems to be happening is prey will often turn into a current. So what appears to happen in a lot of cases, this is a, a goby in a tube that can't turn, is the blowing, and you see sand being displaced there. There's going to be a head moving in. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Um, the gobies will often turn the, toward the, the predator, which is a perfect way to swallow a prey. If you're going to eat a fish, head first is always best. And it's going to pump up a bit, and then you can see it's blowing right at the head, and then, ouch. <laughs> and then, these, this is my graduate student, so, all right, now we're going to put dye in front of them. <laughs> yep, they're definitely blowing at the prey. <laughs> <laughs> So another unique form of behavior. So these guys are really the consummate invaders. So with all that effective predation, we've measured the growth rates by tag and, tag and recapture of small fish in both oceans. And you can see that, that in the invaded range, they grow much more rapidly, the upper curve, and they attain a, a higher population level average size than in their native uh, Pacific range. They can get up to over um, a half a meter in the invaded range. And in the Pacific, that's completely unheard of. The Pacific maximum size was uh, 40 centimeters up, to, up till then. Most fish are about a foot long. In terms of spawning, there's something else that's unique about them. Um, they mature very quickly within the first year of life at about 15 centimeters total length. Um, they spawn every four days, and most bizarrely of all, they lay eggs in gelatinous masses that most fish that lay eggs like that have demersal eggs. They're, gl they're glued to the seafloor until they hatch. These things, eggs masses, are buoyant. So they spawn in midwater, and these globs of eggs float off. And this has not been studied yet, but it's, it's potential that you know, there's something about that egg mass that inhibits egg predation. But that, that's something still to be studied. Again, another, another characteristic of this species that's, that's completely unique to the Atlantic now. So they release lots of young, and they have a pretty average larval dispersal period of, of about a month. So what we end up with is a population explosion of these things. These are, are, are two curves. The, the inset is a, a local population we studied um, in the Bahamas. The, the larger graph are the um, number of sightings early on during the invasion. In the inset graph, we calculated a 60% growth rate per year. Um, no end in sight yet. They're not quite leveling off, although they're starting to slow down a little bit in some areas. So what you see on reefs is sort of like when you're electroshocking Asian carp, you just see a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. So um, you see gangs of these things hanging out on the reef. Um, this one particular little outcrop with gorgonians and sponges on it, there's 12 lionfish right there in that field of view, all just hanging out. You can go um, on YouTube if you want, look up something like Florida plane wreck lionfish or something if you want to see a giant herd of lionfish with a bunch of guys spearing them. So a big question is, well, are these going to become self-limiting eventually? So my student Casey Benquit has looked at that question. She set up a series of patch reefs where she seeded different densities of juvenile lionfish and followed them through time. Um, and everything was density independent, except for their growth rate. 
but she was able to detect density dependence in the growth rate only when she upped the densities beyond the natural maximum that we ever see on reefs. So you can actually see places where there's eight lionfish per square meter, if you can imagine that. If you, if you jack it up to 10 and 12 and fix it in with lower densities, then you actually can get density dependent growth. So ultimately, these things may eat themselves into limitation, but that's really not the end we want. The only real control right now is predation by us. And so what we have going on now, and a variety of groups have sponsored throughout the invasion range, are, are two sources. One is uh, lionfish derbies, where you get together a bunch of guys who like to spear fish, um, typically at a community scale, and everybody goes out one day, spears as many lionfish as they can, local gourmet chefs come in, prepare the lionfish, and they have a nice big feast at the end, and then there's prizes for the most, the smallest, the biggest, what have you. And that works quite well. Um, studies have shown that you can do these removals every several months, and there's lots of volunteers because there's always a bunch of scuba diving boys who like to spear things, and you send them to spear something that's good to spear in this case. They're quite tasty fish. You have a nice, um, nice barbecue afterwards. This plate always cracks me up because the chef left the dorsal spines on the thing. <laughs> now, now cooking denatures the venom. There's, you, know, you can eat lionfish, you can eat their flesh even without cooking it, um, but um, they're still pokey spine, so this would be a weird, you'd have to like, pull all the spines off. And they've even developed a um, lionfish cookbook to try to encourage um, eating these things. Besides the derbies, there's also targeted fisheries developing by entrepreneurs in the invaded region. Um, one in particular in Cozumel in Mexico where the system is incredibly overfished already, and now there's lots of lionfish. So this entrepreneur is getting the local fishery co-op to catch a bunch of lionfish, pack them up, and ship them off to high-end restaurants in Chicago and New York, selling lionfish as a conservation dish. Save the reef, eat a lionfish, here's your $100 bill, or whatever it is. Um, they're very tasty fish. They taste like rockfish or red snapper. Um, nice white tasty flesh, relatively small fish though, and you have to watch for those spines when you're, when you're preparing them. Now there was recently some work done to um, test whether lionfish were ciguatoxic. Ciguatera is uh, tropical fish poisoning caused by the concentration of a, of a toxin through a, a benthic dinoflagellate concentrated up the food chain. And lionfish started coming up positive for ciguatera. And this was confusing because no one has had ciguatera from eating lionfish and lots of people are starting to eat them. And this concerned us because we thought, uh-oh, people are gonna start not eating them now because they think they're ciguatoxic. A biochemist at University of Hawaii with whom I work, um, Christy Wilcox, who's a, a grad student with a Brian Bowen, a colleague at UH, and I got together and talked about this and she found Interestingly enough, that the, ven the, the venom precursor of lionfish, which is not venom, it's the precursor molecules, which does exist in the flesh of the fish, mimics ciguatoxin in ciguatera tests. So false positive tests may derail efforts to control the invasion. So we got this paper out as fast as we could and popularized it. The solution is simple. If you're concerned about a lionfish being ciguatoxic, cook it first, because cooking denatures the venom, denatures the venom precursor, leaving just the ciguatoxin, which is not denatured by cooking. And then you can run the test and see if they are ciguatoxic. The other thing we're trying to do, but this is totally unofficial. Oh, this is being recorded, isn't it? I won't say that. <laughs> Ask me personally afterwards. <laughs> okay, so the bad news is not much we can do except go down and spear lionfish to keep them under control. So what are the ecological effects of the invasion? As you might guess, they're, they're pretty nasty. But we did find, well, first off, what do we have? We have a situation where, I don't expect you to absorb this, where a mesopredator, a mid-trophic mid level 
piscivore has been inserted into a native food web. That's lionfish there in the middle. So it can interact with a whole variety of species. Um, and so we've been looking at all those various interactions. I don't expect you to follow all this now. We're going to kind of sort of lead you through it. But if you can imagine, a coral reef is a fairly complex system. So there's there's possibilities of not only strong direct effects, but also indirect effects. So one system we've examined, this is Lillian Tuttle's work, is the effect of lionfish on cleaning symbiosis in fishes. That is, on a typical coral reef um, in the Caribbean region, you have the native fish community, which are attacked by a variety of external parasites, but there are these specialized goby, cleaning goby, that that eat those parasites, thereby providing an indirect mutualism between the parasite hosts and the gobies. Enter the lionfish, and as we'll see, um, there are strong effects by the lionfish on the native fish community, but what about the rest of that interaction web? Well, as I've already shown you, not much parasitism of the lionfish. Lillian has also looked at interactions between lionfish and the cleaning gobies. Do the lionfish interfere with cleaning stations or do they actually eat the gobies? And the answer is not much. So, um, and there's actually some indication that cleaning gobies are, are um, distasteful. So this is one part of the food web that doesn't seem to be strongly affected, but pretty much it's the only part, except obviously lionfish can't eat sharks or rays. Um, they don't eat puffers, which are highly toxic, things of that sort. But for everybody else, it's pretty much bad news. This was the, the first field experiment we did where we simply removed lionfish from half of patch reefs, um, 10 in each treatment, followed the recruitment season for just five weeks, and saw an 80% reduction in net recruitment between reefs where there were no lionfish versus reefs where there were lionfish um, through time. <coughs> And as we showed you before, they eat a broad variety of species. Uh, Mark Albans compared the relative effects of a native predator, um, Coney grouper, with the lionfish. So this is, a, again, one of these um, recruitment curves, looking at net recruitment through time under four treatments. The black curve is no predators present on the reef. So that's, that would be the normal level of recruitment in the absence of predation. Um, lionfish alone and lionfish with coney grouper basically allowed no net recruitment. But if you had just the native predator, you saw a 36% reduction in recruitment. That is, native predators aren't nearly as effective in um, removing recruits from reefs as the lionfish are, either alone or with native predators. Much of the experiments I've talked about are, have been on patch reefs. We're talking about reefs, you know, three meters in diameter, not very large. So Mark Albans did a larger scale experiment to bring things up to the scale of management, entire large coral reefs. Um, in some exhausting work on the Bahamas, 10 large reefs that were paired to each other and then keep the lionfish off one set of them and um, allow the lionfish to stay in the others. And these are the results of, of his experiment. This experiment ran for um, just over a year before the lab where we worked closed forever and we lost access to the site. So it was unfortunate that we only got the initial patterns. But he divided the, the prey in this um, experiment to small fish, which are typically targeted by lionfish, versus larger fish, young of the year, that were too large for most lionfish to eat. And then again, this is just looking at um, the number of fish through time. So in the absence of lionfish, you get a pattern like this. And this is very typical of the Bahamas because even though the Bahamas are subtropical, they're also highly seasonal in recruitment. So you start at the beginning of the summer, you get high net recruitment, but then over the winter, um, recruitment is balanced, more than balanced, by mortality. So you get this sort of annual cycle. High recruitment in the summer, low in the winter, and then fish grow to larger sizes. Lionfish clearly had an effect, um, lowering recruitment or abundance of small fish by about three fish per square meter. 
no effect on the larger fish, which isn't surprising because lionfish weren't eating them, but we were hoping this experiment would run long enough so that you could see the time lag as small fish being removed translated into larger fish, but not able to do that. More disconcertingly was the effect of lion on the species that were being eaten. So this shows in this experiment by both density and biomass, the top 10 species being consumed. Most consumed species being a goby and a wrasse. But if you look at all those species, you'll see in both lists that three of the species are parrotfish. And this is of great concern for the resilience of coral reefs. The reason being that herbivores on reefs are, especially parrotfish, are very important at keeping seaweeds, algae, under control so that they don't have negative effects on corals. Um, seaweeds can outcompete corals, they inhibit settlement of corals, they often will hide or house pathogens that attack corals. So with humans in the system, there's been overfishing of herbivores, which is allowing the, cor the algae to proliferate at the expense of corals. Pa um, lionfish are essentially the fishermen of dinky fish. So instead of targeting the adults, they're targeting the juveniles and further pressing the system away from dominance by corals. So this is what we're afraid the future of coral reefs will be in the Caribbean. We're already, many of the reefs have already died. I know it's depressing. But in Mark's experiment, we're starting to also see extirpations of native species, and that, that really has our concern. So over the course of his experiment, um, for small species, um, there was a loss of about five species per reef at this large reef scale, and that, is not, that does not bode well for the future of reefs. Looking at a species-specific level, um, last student I'm going to talk about here, Kurt Ingeman's work, um, shows you the power of having studied this system before the invasion. So what you see here are um, per capita mortality curves for a species of basslet, fairy basslet, which is a very popular aquarium fish, beautiful animal, purple fading to yellow, they're just absolutely gorgeous fish, but they like to live under ledges, which is where lionfish like to hang out. So they're one of the main prey of lionfish. Before the lionfish invasion, my student Michael Webster had studied demography and, and population dynamics in fairy basslet and had found that mortality, shown here in the black curves and the black points, was density dependent, strongly density dependent, and in fact followed these through generations and showed that this was actually a source of local population regulation. Following the invasion, Kurt went back working with Michael to exactly the same reefs, exactly the same populations, and set up exactly the same experiment. So a wonderful before-after comparison. And what he found were the red points and interestingly, when you, when you st analyze these statistically in a linear mixed effect model, the slopes were no different of these two density dependent curves. So what that means is that lionfish are adding density independent mortality on top of any existing density dependence caused by native predators. And this does not bode well because high levels of density independent mortality can push things um, over the top. Um, and in fact, in some cases, we got nearly near extirpation. So what we have is an incredibly voracious predator, very good at what it's doing, nobody's stopping it, and it's sweeping through the Caribbean region rapidly um, with no end in sight. So um, if you're interested in any of the papers I've talked about, we, we maintain a lionfish webpage and all our papers are there to download. And uh, thanks so much for coming. Now Happy to answer questions. <laughs> yes? So do you 
you think there's a real solution to the problem? I mean, you talked about the, uh, the derbies they have. That seems pretty effective, but that's pretty local. So, so the question is, are there solutions to the problem? And right now, the only solution is human removals. And you're right, it's perfectly local. You can create a hole in this invasion by removing lionfish from a particular reef and keep them off. And so far, that's working. But through time, if, these, if this invasion runs to completion, there's not going to be many recruits coming in from outside because all the, you know, there's not going to be many fish out there. Our hope is that through time, before lionfish start limiting themselves through within species competition, is that something's going to step up. If their densities get sufficiently high, they'll be ripe for a, a pandemic of some kind. If some pathogen steps up, parasites may learn to start attacking them. I don't know about predators. Unless the predators start finding the new recruits, I don't think predators are going to do much. So. I'm not extremely hopeful, but hope springs eternal. So along those lines, I remember a few years ago, I heard some stories that, that someone had reported that some species of shark were, were starting to prey on them, but I guess you would know whether that was the case. Yeah, what happened was there were divers that started feeding speared lionfish to reef sharks as well as to NASA grouper. And what you can train these animals to do is eat speared lionfish. They will not attack unspeared lionfish. <laughs> and what starts happening is they become nuisances. So people started diving at places and the sharks were swimming all around them going, give me the lionfish, spare a lionfish for me. The grouper, hilariously, large NASA grouper, became like pointer dogs. They'd seek out lionfish and they'd just point to them. <laughs> spear it. <laughs> now there are, there just recently, just this past week, there was a video that someone sent me that showed a lionfish that apparently had been trained because it, it cornered a lionfish, as a grouper, cornered a lionfish and it started sort of nudging it away from the reef. And then it started circling it, trying to go head first at the lionfish. And the lionfish wouldn't let it. It was, you know, doing this the whole time. Um, because, you know, if you tack tail first, you're just going to get a whole bunch of spines. Clearly that grouper had encountered lionfish before. And had probably eaten them before and learned to eat them head first, which probably works. Now, was that trained or not trained? Um, we don't know. And maybe, maybe NASA group will start learning, but then we're at the same problem. They're so overfished everywhere. Another possibility are um, Goliath grouper, these giant grouper. And there's been observations of them swallowing lionfish. But again, they're severely overfished. So the fish that are most prone to be our saviors are the most overfished in the system. Murphy's Law. Yeah. 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 A save save the lionfish campaign is is the solution, but it's already. I mean, people have started that a long time ago before the invasion, and the problem is these are such popular food fish, and. Um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of poor nations throughout the Caribbean, so people are going to eat them. And the, and the problem with grouper, of course, is they have spawning aggregations where they all, from hundreds of miles around, swim to the same location when they spawn. And at that time, fishermen just hammer them because they will, you know, you can catch them at that time. So they bring all these fish up, and I've seen them cleaning these fish on the beach, and all that row just goes right into the sand and dies. So I... I don't know what to do, but yeah, that would be great. But it, you know, it's just so ironic that we as human beings end up introducing the worst species we could almost, and the one species that could have given us the biotic resistance we've already overfished. It's truly tragic. No, okay. I had a question about that. So we introduced these guys, and I was wondering about those differences in growth rates. 
Are those inherent genetic differences that because we were breeding these guys from pet trade or we were selecting fish from pet trade, or is that just because they've got free reign and they eat anything? Yeah, that's a good question. From from as far as we know, the the fish that are brought over through the aquarium trade are strictly wild caught. They have they're very tough fish, so there's not like there's much selection and transport. And genetically, they're from Philippines and Indonesia, which is sort of the center of distribution. So it's unlikely that there's been sufficient selection taking place for larger size. And um, what we're doing right now is bioenergetically trying to figure out whether just due to eating larger prey um, and the difference between the parasite load between the Pacific and the uh, Caribbean can explain that difference. Yes? So have we examined reefs where there's there's a lot of Nassau grouper? And well, is that the question? I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, Cu the Cuban reefs are in very good shape, relatively speaking. Yeah, so Cuba, so the question is is whether um, we've worked in places like Cuba where there's um, very strong regulation of fishing. Um, there are actually, we've not worked in Cuba, but there are comparable places in the Bahamas like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park where there's been, you know, very strong fishing ban for, for many years. And what's been found there is a negative correlation between lionfish abundance and Nassau grouper abundance that seems to be this immensalism effect at the local scale, but the problem is it's very localized. So what happens, what happens in those situations with all the grouper milling around is the lionfish go and start feeding out in the seagrass bed. So they, you know, they, their growth rate stays the same. They'll still come and shelter on that reef, but they seem to be getting their, their prey elsewhere. So I don't think the immensalism is going to be the answer. The answer is going to be the predators developing a taste for lionfish and developing a means of capturing them efficiently without getting mouthful of spines. Yeah. You said I think that the uh, the eggs are sort of free floating. Yes. And any way to track those as they hatch and, and try to figure out where those come or go? Yeah. So has anybody has anybody track those these egg egg masses once they're spawned and not yet no I mean that that question is wide open right now we've been busy studying the fish on the reefs but it's wide open whether or not those egg masses are toxic or at least distasteful and um, exactly you know what the what the hatching success is out of these things it's wide open good project <laughs> are there any marine protected areas in the Bahamas and if so have you seen any differences and communities or effects in one or the other, and if not, are they working on getting some initiated? Yeah, so the, the question has to do with marine reserves in the Bahamas. The Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park is one of the oldest reserves in the Caribbean region, and that's where we have seen these negative correlations between locally lionfish abundance and NASA grouper abundance. Um, I've helped the Bahamas get a network of marine reserves started, and they're starting to implement them. The problem is, as it is in most nations that aren't wealthy is enforcement. So um, up till recently, the entire Bahamian archipelago, which is enormous, had one patrol boat. And they would, on, even though there's no fishing allowed on spawning aggregations, you know, they'd go take the boat and park on one aggregation and sit there for the few weeks and the other ones are still being fished. There's nothing else they could do. So, you know, Public education and getting buy-in by the fishing community is going to be essential for any kind of solution. Okay, thanks again. Great questions.